Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Club, where we are devoted to conversations of consequence that help democracy thrive. My name is Cynthia Connolly. I'm the Director of Programming here at the City Club, about a month and a half into my tenure here. I'm thrilled to welcome you all here today. This is our second in-person forum here at the City Club, and I'm just thrilled to be here. Thank you. Round of applause for everyone here. We're here today for On the Waterfront, Connecting Neighborhoods to the Shore. And uh, today's forum is presented by the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy as they celebrate 75 years, as well as Mansoor Gavin, uh, LPA. And I do have Ben Starrett here from the Lincoln Institute. He's a senior advisor for partnership and he'll be giving a couple remarks. Good afternoon. Uh, it's really great to be here. Thank you very much. This is the third of four forums that we're co-sponsoring, part of celebrating our 75th anniversary. So uh, other people will talk about today's program. So I just want to say the fourth of these will be held on September 24th when we'll be back. And that day, we're also doing a street fair in Public Square. We're going to be having a keynote with Reverend Dr. Moss the third um, at Old Stone Church and a lot of other activities that are going on as part of our 75th anniversary celebration. So I encourage you to come, put it on your calendar and join us if you can. So with that, back to Cynthia. Thank you, Ben. Uh, we also want to give a quick thank you to our community partners. We couldn't do this without you guys. Uh, first, Northwest Neighborhoods. We have the Trust for Public Land as well as the Cleveland Water Alliance. So I'm going to invite Samantha Martin up here to give her quick remarks. Hi, everyone. My name is Samantha Martin. I am the communications manager at the Cleveland Water Alliance. It's so nice to see so many familiar, friendly faces in person today. Um, Eric actually afforded me my first internship at Ohio City Inc. 10, 11 years ago now, so very full circle moment. Um, at Cleveland Water Alliance, if you're not familiar with us, we sit at the intersection of technology, of innovation, of job crea creation, research, and sustainability all surrounding our Great Lake. Uh, upcoming, we have our Erie Hack competition this year. It's our biannual hacking competition. So we bring together engineers, coders, and creatives to solve issues surrounding our Great Lake because the issues do pose incredible opportunities for us. Um, we're not the only ones facing these problems, and we can position ourselves to be the forefront for uh, problem solvers uh, around surrounding water-related issues. As you know, this is not only a national but an international issue with harmful algal blooms, with droughts. Um, we are looking for sponsors, for partners, for participants. So if you, your organization, is interested in participating in some way, whether that's through creating solutions or for sponsoring the event, please come chat with us or visit eriehack.io. Thank you. Thanks, Samantha. Uh, really quick, some housekeeping things. We have gone green here at the City Club. If you notice the center of your table, there is a QR code. That will get you your digital program. So go ahead and open up your smartphone, uh, use your camera app, and take a picture, and it should pop right up. And you can find more about our programming to com that's coming up. Uh, Next Friday, we are back in person again. Uh, tickets are still available for this forum. It's Climate, Conversation, and Community Power, and we'll be talking about how to invest in environmental activism that centers BIPOC voices. Uh, we're also hosting the Cleveland mayoral primary debates in partnership with IdeaStream Public Media. That is August 10th and 17th. Uh, we are taking questions directly from uh, citizens in the audience. So if you have a question that you would like to ask our future mayor, uh, please see Alyssa Raybuck and you can actually ask your question on video and it may make it into the show. Uh, for the microphone, we will have a little bit of a different policy than we had in the past than last March. Uh, we will get to that uh, when it comes to the Q&A time. Uh, and as usual, you can tweet a question at the City Club, and you can text them to 330-541-5794. A reminder to please silence your cell phones. And um, also, you can support City Club's mission by making a contribution online or becoming a member by texting the word DONATE to 216-616-CLUB. Any 
donations today, you will receive a free City Club Centennial book. And with that, uh, as Dan always says, if you have not said hello to a neighbor at your table, please take this time to do so, and we will start shortly. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Tony Coyne, president of the law firm of Mansur Gavin. I'm also a 39-year member of the City Club. And it's great to be back here in person at the Citadel of Free Speech introducing today's forum, On the Waterfront, Connecting Neighborhoods to the Shore. Today's forum is part of the Lincoln Institute's 75th anniversary celebration, and it is co-sponsored by the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy and the law firm Mansur Gavin. An important element of the celebration includes the City Club Forum Series, which aims to explore the role of land policy in addressing society's most pressing social, economic, and environmental challenges. The Lincoln Institute is engaging in these discussions in both in Cleveland, both because of its roots in the area, and also as part of its Legacy Cities initiative. This initiative supports a nationwide network of community and government leaders working to create shared prosperity in cities transitioning from industrial economies. Today our topic is equitable access to our waterfronts. Ohio lakes and rivers provide important space for recreation, social gatherings, and simply a place to cool off. This makes public access to the waterfront vital to the social fabric of our communities. Yet 90% of Cuyahoga County shoreline is inaccessible to the public. Both social and physical barriers have prevented residents, especially in low-income communities, from interacting with our region's greatest asset, 
the water and the shores of Lake Erie. So today we ask, how can lakefront cities leverage development and land use policy to make waterfront access more equitable for all? And over the last several years, three Ohio cities, Euclid, Sandusky, and Cleveland, have taken steps to increase waterfront access. And today we are joined by leadership from each of these three great cities to discuss what has worked, as well as challenges and opportunities we face with our waterfront access. Guiding today's conversation is Rick Jackson, senior host and producer with IdeaStream Public Media. So Rick, I turn the program over to you to introduce our esteemed panel. Tony, thank you so much for setting up the course of our conversation for the next hour, much appreciated. To talk about the challenges that we face and successes we've seen in recent months and recent years, actually, I'm joined by Kirsten Holzheimer Gale, mayor of the city of Euclid for more than five years now, by city manager Eric Wobser of Sandusky, a Sandusky native who's been at his post for about seven years now, and planning director Freddie Collier of the city of Cleveland, who took that job actually about a week after Eric took his. Later in the hour, we'll have the opportunity for you to ask them questions as well. Both those of you here at the City Club, those listening online or through WCPN, text those questions to 330-541-5794. Mary Gale, Euclid recently completed the first part of the city's lakefront trail, part of this transformative waterfront improvement plan. I wanted to start there because precisely that is why we're here today, to talk about how we connect people to the water again. For you, it's both about access and having it as an asset. How critical is this advancement to having people want to live and play in Euclid? Uh, th thank you for the question. Um, and thank you everyone for coming. It's great to be here in person. Um, I do want to th thank the Lincoln Land Institute and Mansur Gavin um, and want to give a shout out to Lincoln Electric, who is our largest employer and has been their, had their home in Euclid for 125 years. So. Uh, we're thrilled to have them. Um, Euclid is absolutely a legacy city. Euclid, uh, many people know it in, the, is in its industrial heyday. We were home to TRW, Chase Brass, a GM plant. People moved there, flocked there for jobs, for good schools, in a community, um, the, a strong community. And then we saw some change in that and uh, really wanted to focus on how do we make Euclid a strong city, how do we continue its strong legacy of being a great place to live? Um, and we really saw the lakefront as that really important factor. And so, as you said, it's an asset. It was, is our, one of our greatest assets, but it really wasn't accessible to most of the residents. Um, I had the great fortune to grow up living right on the lake. My parents are still there. We had private access to Lake Erie, and it was part of who I am, who our family was, we enjoyed and who, the neighborhood that I lived in. And so really at the root of it, we, I want everyone to have that same experience. How do you get down? How do you enjoy, get to enjoy the lake? And so our project really opened up access to our community. Um, it was priv privately owned in most parts, not accessible to most people. Um, four high rise apartments right in the project area that could look at the lake but couldn't get down to the lake. So. Uh, it's been a project, it's been a great project, but the important part of the project is not the trail, um, it's how the trail and the project has transformed our community. Thank you. Eric Wobster, like Euclid Sandusky, has been working on access for several years. You previously said that COVID just punched you guys in the face because of regional <laughs> dependence on tourism and the entertainment industry. And coming right after Sandusky invested millions of dollars into the new Jackson Street Pier, new bikeway, the 2020 planned opening really is only kind of happening now. You actually had a concert there last night. Um, what does this new access to the shoreline mean to the people of Sandusky? I think it means everything. You know, when people think of Sandusky, of course, they think of Cedar Point, and that's why we were so vulnerable to the pandemic. But in addition to that, they think of Sandusky Bay, Lake Erie, the Lake Erie Islands, and it really is, particularly in a post-industrial economy where we had been so dependent. We had a GM plant and a Ford plant in the Sandusky region. We've lost both of those. Uh, and really the pivot was towards the lake, but the sustainability of the lake is so critical. And if you want people to believe in the sustainability of the lake, then you need to give them access to the lake. And, and Sandusky is a very narrow town that kind of spreads linearly along the lake. Very, in very few parts of the city, does anyone live more than a mile or a mile and a half to the lake? But because, like Ohio, like Cuyahoga County, over 90% of our shoreline has been privately owned, they lacked access to the lake. So what you didn't see in Sandusky often enough were lakefront pre 
premiums or a quality of life that was benefiting from being a lakefront town. And so what our city commission president, uh, Dick Brady, who's here, Commissioner Blake Harris, uh, and the entire city commission, as well as many of our staff who made it today, really made a push several years ago to open up access to the lake, to reinvest in it, not only as a tool for economic development, which has been very successful for us. We've had over 300 million invested in the city over the past five years, much of it right along the investments we've made in the lake, but in addition to that, as an opportunity for equity for all of our residents. You know, we're the most diverse city in our region, we're the most low income city in our region, and we are providing opportunities through not only creating that public access to Sandusky Bay and to our downtown waterfront, but through the programming our recreation team is here. We have provided free and accessible and common programming that is meant to be very representative of all the people that come to our city or live in our city. And, and in that, you see our waterfront uh, not being uh, not being viewed as gated or privatized marinas anymore, but being a space where people can feel a part of the community. And, and really, I think that is what Sandusky is becoming. I think it's what we need for all of Lake Erie and the legacy cities along it to, to truly realize our potential in the 21st century. In the few weeks since you've had the Thursday night concert series, other things going on there, are you getting the participation you want? Yeah, it's been incredibly exciting. And, and we plan to do all of this, as you mentioned. We were... Uh, launching the new pier and the new shoreline drive which was the first mile of our Sandusky Bay pathway in 2020 because of COVID we were unable to do any of this and coming out of our bicentennial vision plan we had many sponsors that helped us purchase a stage an LED movie screen funding for programming and we couldn't do it what was exciting to us was in spite of the fact that we couldn't do all that programming last year people still found their way down we averaged about a thousand pedestrians during the day downtown on the waterfront which if you had heard that about Sandusky's downtown five years ago you wouldn't have believed it because it felt like a ghost town and, and when I came back to Sandusky and walked the waterfront the day before I started in my current position I said everything's great except for there's no people and, and I think now we've brought people down there and then when we added programming to that this summer uh, I know we did one free concert that came up really quickly, uh, and I think there were probably three to 5,000 people, not only at the concert itself, but just in downtown Sandusky all at one time. And I had one of our commissioners say that he had never in his adult life, he's nearly 70 years old, seen downtown Sandusky feel so vibrant. And, and it's important because we heard from a lot of people during that process that we were revitalizing the waterfront, not for the people of Sandusky, but for private development. And the reality is this programming was free, it was diverse, it was representative, and, and, and that's the value of public space, particularly on a waterfront. So I think we've been very excited, and, and now that we'll have a year to plan going into next year, we've already got a lot of ideas about how to take that to the next level. Great example, thanks. Freddie Collier, Cleveland has problems unique amongst this panel, just partly because of the miles of coastline that you have, but the variety of what's along the water. You've got the Port Authority, you've got an airport, you've got residences, you've got industry, multiple recreational outlets, a lot to manage, a lot of partners to negotiate with, all amid a growing recognition that the lake and the river really are amenities Cleveland next needs to take more advantage of. Where do you focus first? Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for having me. Uh, and when we think about Cleveland in comparison to the other uh, cities along our um, Lake Erie waterfront, we have eight miles of waterfront that we have to account for, uh, not to mention the river valley. So Cleveland has two waterfront assets that we have to take full advantage of. And there's some historic dichotomies that create the situation that we're in now. Uh, when you look at the eight mile stretch of waterfront, you know, Cleveland is a city that was built on commerce and a lot of the decisions that were made in the past were based on economic development. It wasn't necessarily about the environment. It wasn't about access, none of those things. And part of what we're doing now is really trying to right those wrongs. So when we look at our waterfront, particularly the Cuyahoga River Valley, as well as our eight mile stretch of waterfront, we have to overcome literally a lot of issues. And when we did the waterfront district plan uh, that was done uh, a number of years ago, we really wanted to look at the entire eight mile stretch and then really focus on specific geography. So you have the uh, western waterfront, the core waterfront, and the eastern waterfront. And most recently, we just adopted the vision for the valley. What we've witnessed is that there has been private development that has happened, but a lot of that development is disjointed, not connected. And one of our goals was to bring the people in the communities to those waterfront assets. And in order to do that, and I'll give you one example uh, on the West Shore Way, uh, we literally had to punch through and under the actual railroad tracks to connect people who lived in the Detroit Shoreway neighborhood to the asset of Edge Water Park. Uh, that was a heavy lift. Yes. We had to rethink the uh, shoreway there 
which was another heavy lift financially, not to mention all of the engagement that has to take place. But we did a lot of that with the understanding that this waterfront is God's gift to the community and nobody should be void of having access to it. And then when you look at the downtown waterfront, we were thinking along the lines of connecting people via bridges and these really narrow uh, ways to get to and fro. But the thinking has evolved in the sense that we need to connect the entire downtown grid to the water. And we're doing that uh, with the most recent uh, plan that you uh, all seen with respect to the partnership with the Browns. Um, also on the River Valley side, how do we begin to connect the grid down to the water? So this notion of making sure that we have open space assets. And I will tell you about open space. A lot of people think that open space is a you know, feel good prospect. It's an economic driver. We've seen it with trail development. We've seen how housing is really locating right next to trails and people wanna be next to those uh, natural amenities and they create a true economic asset for us. So we're constantly um, going back and forth with addressing the challenges and trying to flip those and turn those into opportunities. Battery Park, again, another example, that was a battery plant previously. Now it's a development. And then you had a natural asset connecting those dots. We're doing that downtown, and we're going to be doing that on the eastern waterfront. I'm glad you mentioned that impediment that we all see every day, the shoreway. It's a walled off the community in a way that at least our other cities don't have to deal with. They have much more space between highway and water. Um, so many people, it's not just a problem of equity, which is the other part we want to talk about. It is accessibility. How soon can the east side see what the west side's gotten when you talk about punching under railroad tracks? Sure. So um, you have to take first what the environment gives you. And when you look at the neighborhoods that uh, flank our waterfront, particularly on the east side, you have streets like 55th Street, you have streets like 72nd Street, you have the signature uh, corridor of where Rockefeller Park connects to the waterfront. So you have to maximize mm -hmm. those first and foremost and create better connections there. And then the additive things that uh, you can do is also create you know, uh, bridges and also look at where you have underutilized or undertapped recreational assets like Gordon Park, extremely <laughs> underutilized asset. And you have a lot of land opportunity just south of Gordon Park. The other uh, thing that we're doing that's really important is really looking at how we draw people to the water and making sure that you have pedestrian and bike connections that connect you to the water. Most recently, we partnered with the uh, Metro Parks to look at the Cheers uh, initiative and really look at how we create a coastline, particularly on the eastern side of the city, that's going to draw people from all over the city and the region. Many of the projects that you're going to see uh, come to life along our waterfront are not just for those people who are directly flanking the water, but we're also reaching our tentacles out into the region because these are regional assets. Irish Town Bend is a perfect example. Uh, you look at the uh, Cheers initiative, you look at the, uh, the Browns initiative, you look at all of these signature pieces. These are going to be the draws that really start to bring people back to the water. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that we have to also understand, and I think all of the panelists understand, that we are part of a continuum. And I think capitalizing on what we did with the waterfront uh, plan, district plan, I see Debbie Berry over there, who was my colleague, who actually sat next to me in a cube <laughs> when we were working on the citywide plan and waterfront district plan. This administration has been very diligent um, under the leadership of Ken Silliman, uh, really advancing that work. So it's about implementing the plan. So when you have these plans in place, the most important thing you could do is work the plan. So this is a continuum. And the next generation of uh, folks are going to have to really pick up the ball and carry that forward. But this is a great blueprint, and we're doing great work transactionally. Mm -hmm. Mary Gale, your, your project has taken years to come to the point where it is now. Um, you are, as you said, a low-income city. You're a majority-minority city, but with half-million-dollar lakeshore homes as well. Do you have some secret sauce for making the beaches reflective of those different types of people who are in Euclid, uh, something you can say to the people who do use as well as the people who do not? Sure, yeah, I mean, that's a really a, a big part of our plan was equity. We wanted everybody to have access to the lake, um, no matter where they lived in the city. Um, uh, the secret sauce for us is really, um, as you said, it's been lengthy. Um, it's been a long process. It's, we've had to be persistent. We've had to be creative. 
uh, certainly dependent on partnerships. Uh, but at the root, it started with a community consensus. So we pulled together residents, stakeholders, businesses, the community at large to help us develop the vision. Um, we had a great consultant, Smith Group, who has done waterfront work um, across the Great Lakes and really helped us take advantage of the geography we had, um, but imagined something new. I mean, I think the plan certainly transitioned and you know, was reformulated through the process. Um, we pulled together funding sources from so many different places. So it, you know, we address erosion control, we have environmental issues, we have economic development issues, we have equity issues, um, and really providing a community um, open access and park space along the lake that has been really transformative. Um, it wouldn't have happened without the support of city council and our city council president, Charlene Mancuso is here and ward five councilwoman, Christine McIntosh um, and a former city council president, John Monroe, um, Allison Lucas -E Love, our planning director and former planning director, Jonathan Holliday, who now is with Sandusky. Um, I mean, it's, it's been, you have to be persistent. The partnerships are important focusing on the assets. But for us, it really is about that. How do we open up access to everybody? Mm -hmm. um, it's not just a north side project. It's a city of Euclid project. It's a regional project. Um, and we're really thrilled that now it's being viewed as the Euclid model. And so I don't, actually, can I take a second just to explain the, pro I don't even know if everybody is aware or familiar mm -hmm. with our project. Um, it's a three quarter mile multi-purpose trail along the shoreline. Uh, we did have to break it up into phases. So again, that's an important, I think, secret sauce. Yes, uh, we hired Smith Group in 2009 who helped us develop the plan. We started with the pier as phase one. The trail had to be broken up into two phases because of funding. Um, and our next phase, we do have a marina on paper. Um, that's our next phase if we, once we get past uh, this phase. But we really are, it's, it's taken a lot. And a city like Euclid, we're always, we've always been since my involvement scraping for pennies. So how do you, um, you know, how do you commit the funds needed? And we're so fortunate to have partners like the Metro Parks and Cuyahoga County and so EPA and Army Corps and federal funding, state funding, county funding, lo funding, local funding. I mean, we could not have done it without really that persistence, the partnerships, the cooperation, and the residents, at, really at the root of it, the residents being involved and in favor of it. I was trying to think about how many years ago it was that IdeaStream did a piece on this when it's coming together, maybe five or six, but there is a great YouTube video out there you can look at that explains, basically through drone shots, how this would, would work. It's, it is a beautiful project. Folks, a survey released just this week by the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative informs us that waterfront communities as a whole have, in the last two years, spent $878 million for shoreline repairs. Ohio's 24 coastline towns will spend something like $400 million in the next two years just to fight off coastal erosion. Uh, next five years, sorry. Mary Gale, what's one of your biggest concerns? Erosion, of course. $6 million of phase two for your project was local money, city and county. I know you'd rather spend it on cash and parks and employee raises and Christmas bonuses, but your share of erosion control is heavy. And you said you're a low income community. Are taxpayers on the hook for that? And do taxpayers perceive that they're on the hook for that? Taxpayers do, I think some taxpayers do perceive that they're on the hook. Um, most of the funding that we've committed locally will be repaid through a tax increment finance zone. So we were able to um, create a zone in that area and the ta increased tax value will pay for most of the improvements that we've had to pay. Uh, we did think it was important to have some local skin in the game. So yes, we did commit some local capital funds to that, um, which we felt was important. We're asking and we had private donations. We have great partner in K&D um, who owned the apartment complex in the, in the project area. Um, we, we felt it was important that we committed our own money to you know, mm -hmm. put our own skin in the game. But for the most part, our residents um, will not pay for it. Um, it's being paid for through, as I mentioned, county casino funds. We were um, the first recipient mm -hmm. outside of Cleveland for county casino funds. And we certainly appreciate the county's support in that. Um, but paying it back primarily through tax, the, the increased value of the property tax. Something I want to hear from all of you on, I'll just start with Eric and work our way down. Do you hear pushback from people who say, I don't use the lake, I don't go down there, I don't have a boat, I don't know how to swim, why should I pay for this? What's the response? 
Uh, we don't tend to hear that. I think it is naturally intuitive to people in Sandusky that the lake is an asset, whether one of the things that we've done and, and part of a partnership, uh, our city commission recently worked to save a, a, a boat, uh, I, guess, I don't know what you call the good time, it's not quite a ferry boat, but it's a, a, a pleasure boat. boat. Yeah, pleasure boat. And it was going through some issues, it had some unexpected repairs and the community really stepped up, including our city commission president, Dick Brady, and the rest of the commission to support bringing them back. And one of the things that we were able to do uh, in, in putting some resources as, as, uh, via a grant into the saving the good time was we got community access. They agreed to up to six times a year. Now we can take the community out on the boat. And that's something that we did during our bicentennial vision planning process was we invited people out onto the lake for free. And what we found is there are many, many residents of Sandusky who though, even though they live in this lakefront community that has you know, been named the best coastal small town or the best place to live affordably on the lake, they had never been out on the water. They had never actually seen the city from the lake. They had never seen Cedar Point and the view from the lake back on Hotel Breakers with the roller coasters. And so we're trying to find ways both on the shore but also in the water to creatively give better access to Sandusky's. And, and one of the, the challenges that we do face, the pushback that we do get, is of that private ownership of the lake much more so. Those who live in a house on the lake or live in a gated community on the lake or a private concern on the lake who push back against public access. And we're navigating that conversation right now as we develop the right of way for the Sineski Bay Pathway, which is meant to be an 11 mile trail that connects one end of the city to the other that we hope will eventually become part of a much larger trail. And I think that's the fight that we need to take on all of us together as we try to connect our communities. And that's really the equity situation here. Is, you know, we talk about equity, I just read a statistic last week that said the United States right now about one third of the wealth is in the hands of 1% of the population. And that is consistent with where France was at the time of the French Revolution. And I think when we try to address those issues, uh, we look to Washington often, but we also have to look at the choices that we make locally. Ohio's shoreline is over 90% privately owned. It is the most privately owned shore or coastline in the entire United States of America. That is an equity issue. And so we have to find ways to make choices in spite of opposition. I know in Lake Avenue right now in Cleveland is, is one of those examples. And I'm sure Director Collier is living through that. I'm sure Ken Silman's glad he's no longer part of that conversation. But that's the reality. That, that's the fight that we're facing right now is the, the lake is the people's lake. It is a natural resource. It is not owned by someone just because they have private property on it. And we have to fight. We have to fight to overcome the opposition to the people that think they own Lake Erie or they think they own access to Lake Erie. And sometimes that's a trail running in front of your house. Sometimes it's a trail running behind your house. It's a really creative private solution like what they're doing in Euclid. But what we can't do is back down from that because there is opposition. I think that is one of the most important things we can do locally in a lakefront community to be a part of the equity conversation. Yeah. That's what I want to hear from all of you on this. Person. Yeah, and I, so I think that's part of what's precedent setting about our project is it is private property for the most part. We have we were able to acquire some, um, but the private property owners at, above the trail gave permanent easements so that the trail could be built on the lake. 100 of them, right? 100 different people had to sign off on it, and that includes there's homeowners associations that run um, up to the lake and they own the lakefront parcel together. So all of those mm -hmm. residents had to sign off on this project. So again, it involved a tremendous amount of engagement by the residents. Mm -hmm. This project would not happen if that had not happened. Um, but that's really what it's about is opening up so it's not private. And there was some pushback, oh, you're spending this money, you're doing this project to support a couple of private lakefront homeowners. No, we're really building this so the entire community can come down and enjoy the lake. And to your earlier point, during COVID, people were clamoring to get down there. The project was under construction and people are kind of going around the fence to check it out. And people want to be outside. They want, they really, I think just getting down to the waterfront, we've seen a tremendous increase in the use of our parks. Um, of people coming down and enjoying it. And it's not complete. The trail, the second phase of the trail will be complete by the end of the year, but people are down there enjoying it, using it um, from all over the city. You go down and you, it's not people who live on the north side, it's people from all over the community 
from outside of the community. Say from Willowick, from Cleveland, your borders? We yeah. get people from yeah. Yeah, the Cuyahoga counties looking at also opening up access. They have a planning process underway. And so after several of their public meetings, we'll be down there and we'll see people from Bratnall or from the west side Lakewood wanting to see, because you have to see what it looks like. It's hard to understand on paper, and I think there's some photos that are being shown. Um, it's hard to visualize because it's not mm -hmm. something you would naturally think of. We had rocks and erosion and cliffs that were crumbling into the lake, and we now have beautiful park space open to everybody along the shoreline. Um, so it's been, uh, people really need to come down, and I would invite everybody, uh, Sims Park, uh, 228 and Lakeshore Boulevard, uh, come down and see it because it's really spectacular, and I think very exciting to think about what Cleveland and what Cuyahoga County and even regionally what NOACA is looking at doing is how do we build on what Euclid has been able to accomplish across the whole shoreline. Just to restate the question, um, people who don't go to the water mm -hmm. live far away. Lee Miles, mm -hmm. for instance, you're not near the water. Right. Why should they care? Yeah, a couple of things, and I want to give an example. Uh, when we went through the engagement process for Vision for the Valley, um, one of the things that we did with the many engagement efforts that we had is we went out to sort of those outlying communities that were far from the actual lake um, and to engage them. And many people didn't have time to come down. They just don't have any reason to come down down or experience the waterfront. And I think it goes to uh, uh, Eric's point uh, about really exposure. I think that's critical. And um, the exposure happens uh, by having the right programming um, and sending the right message. Private development uh, can send a message that you're not welcome. And one of the things that we've been really working with private interest uh, around is making sure that there is open space amenities for people to be able to access and touch the water. Now, that takes advocacy, and you can't just do it with advocacy, is what we've learned, is that you have to regulate it. You know, people don't do the right thing because it's right. You know, and you have to put the systems in place, and uh, Councilmember Catelli, you know, knows this at the council table, we often have to uh, look like the uh, villain or being accused of impeding development because we are, are trying to position the city in the right way. So I'll give you an example of one of the things that we had uh, instituted citywide, which was the riparian setback zone. Um, and that was for all of our waterways, with the exception of the federal navigable channel, which is our riverfront. So you can't do that because our uh, river is a utilitarian river. It's a functioning uh, river that has you know, uh, barges and things of that nature. Um, so we, we were limited there. But here we are with this unique conflict with the Cuyahoga River Valley where you have maritime uses, you have uh, recreational boating, and you also have the utilitarian vessel, vessels. And these things are starting to converge more and more. They're not stopping. So one of the reasons why the Vision for the Valley was so important was to reconcile how do you take all of these different land uses and make them work together? And how do you create opportunities whereby these things can coexist? Now, one example with respect to getting people down to the water is the foundry. And for many of you who may not know what the Foundry does is it really helps to educate young people and others around the, uh, the discipline or the uh, sport of rowing. And they have programs where they reach out to CMSD students and they have classes that are held there. And in that process, these kids are being exposed to the river, what it does, and are being introduced to this amenity. So we have to be very uh, thoughtful uh, with respect to how we introduce the water to the people of the greater region and really get people to understand that this is your asset too. You know, but again, the investment sends the message. So I totally agree uh, with the mayor here that it's not what you do, it's how you go about doing it and how you communicate. And then the last thing I'll say is the branding and the marketing and telling the story is so critical. I think people under, underestimate that. You know, you have to get the word out uh, about it. You have to have a brand that people are going to want to get to know and, and engage with. So I think there's a lot uh, to unpack there in that question, uh, but there's a lot of pieces and moving parts that I think it's gonna take in order to, to really make it equitable for everyone. Thank you.
Another shameless plug, if you want to see a story on the foundry and the CMSD program, I did that too. So, <laughs> yeah. so, but I got to tell you, from talking to those kids, inner city kids who'd never before been on our river, they say, I look at my city in a whole different way now. I've never seen how beautiful Cleveland is from the water. And I can tell you, from sitting in a kayak and then you look up and there's a 700-foot vessel coming at you, you get a whole new respect. <laughs> you really do. Today at the City Club, we are listening to a forum talking about how three cities, Cleveland, Euclid, and Sandusky, have worked toward increasing access to our waterfront. Joining me on stage, Freddie Collier, Director of City Planning, the City of Cleveland. Kirsten Holzheimer Gale, 14th Mayor of Euclid, and Eric Wobster, City Manager of the City of Sandusky. We are about to begin the audience Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, those of you joining in via the live stream or the radio broadcast on WCPN, IdeaStream Public Media. Now, if you have a question here in the audience, our Q&A is going to look a lot, a lot different than it did the last time we were here back in March of 2020. We ask that you raise your hand first to be acknowledged. Wait into your seat until a City Club staffer motions you over to one of two designated microphones to ask your question. Oh, yeah, that's a camera. Where, there's, where are the microphones? There they are. Okay, they're over in the corner. Thank you. I should have asked that earlier. If you're unable to walk to the microphone, then a City Club staffer will bring it to you. As usual, if you'd like to tweet a question, tweet it at the City Club. You can also text them to 330-541-5794. 330-541-5794. We will try our best to work it into the program. Supervising the microphones today, Content and Communications and Program Innovation Manager Alyssa Roebuck and City Club intern, Jokey Yaboa, may we have the first question, please. The city of Chicago has miles and miles of beautiful, wide, sandy beaches that are adjacent to the downtown city. Well, Cleveland, I hear trails, but I don't hear sand beaches. Will we in the city of Cleveland have anything like that? So I'll take a step <laughs> then, obviously. <laughs> um, so Edgewater Park is the best example of a public beach and one that is done really well. When you think about Chicago, the one principle that they followed was that anything east of Lakeshore Boulevard was public. That's a principle. Any smart waterfront community where you have public space, you have a connector that is at grade. Most people have a boulevard, like a Lakeshore Boulevard in Chicago, and then the cityscape. If you don't follow that principle, then this is what you end up with. And again, many of us are here trying to fix those. And this is not just Cleveland. You got Philadelphia and you have a number of cities. They even have now uh, some federal aid that's really looking to help cities uh, with decking over highways so that they can create these connections and reclaim the space that the, uh, the highway system took away from having that access. The question is, will Cleveland have it? That's the trajectory that we're on. Uh, if you look at the uh, core waterfront plan, the one that was most recently uh, developed in partnership, and I emphasize partnership with the Browns, um, it didn't look at a bridge, but it looks at really decking over with a plinth as the first phase. We eventually want to fill in the whole in the donut between West 3rd and East 9th and really begin to connect the grid back to the water. When we go east, same principle is really trying to overcome those obstacles. And I do want to say to the viewing audience out there, you have to understand the rigor, the tenacity, and the fingerprints that it takes to move a project, particularly when there's large infrastructure uh, resources that are involved. The years of focus that it takes to make sure that you're able to pull that off is tremendous. So I think there's a lack of appreciation for that. And when I hear people say, oh, what's the timeline? Oh, it should have been done. Okay. Chicago's doing this. And I don't mean, any, I'm not being uh, facetious, but I think the public needs to be educated about the process and what it takes to go after money, to sell a plan, to really triage, to get these pieces going. You'd be patting us on the back because it's very, very, very rigorous. I guess I could add too. So our project it has a sand beach at the western end and then a sand beach at the eastern end, which is a paddlecraft beach. Um, the Army Corps, and to Freddie's point, our permitting process to do what we did, the permits alone, once we turned the applications in, took a year and a half, 16, 18 months um, for the Army Corps of Engineer, EPA, 
ODNR to approve it. They do not want to approve things in t that go out into the lake right. um, that are not natural. So we have some cobble beaches, which is more of a natural beach in between the two sand beaches. Uh, but right now, the permitting agencies and the regulations would make it very difficult to add a new sand beach into the water. It would have to be probably pulling back land is, mm -hmm. so. And, and to the point that you were making, Chicago didn't become Chicago in 1970. They made that plan back in 1922 or something. Yeah, correct, so and if I may add to that, because this is mm -hmm. really uh, important to understand with respect to who we are and what we are and accepting that. So uh, when you look, for example, at our river valley, when we did Vision for the Valley, one of the things that we did is we looked at what the competition was doing. Everybody's focusing on their waterfront uh, right now. We looked at what Chicago did. Chicago's riverfront you, is like a um, Main Street corridor with buildings right on the water, very unique. We looked at Pittsburgh, Three Rivers. We looked at what they did in Columbus with the Seattle Mile, which is basically green, Greenland, right? Cleveland was the most unique situation out of every city we benchmarked. There was nothing like it from topography, bridges, infrastructure, a mixture of uses. It's a very unique challenge. So we had to really start to focus and say, OK, how do we take this and turn it into the asset? A lot of those challenges that we're talking about with the barges, with the bridges, those are some of the greatest assets that we have down there. How ironic is that? And then we have investment coming in with Flats, East Bank, all of these different places, and we have to figure out, okay, this may seem like a hodgepodge, but really what's the opportunity in it? So how do you start to celebrate and highlight this and create conditions where these things can coexist? So the latest um, uh, recommendation that came out of the Vision for the Valley Plan was really being able to traverse that river by foot or by trail from end to end. So this pedestrian promenade. But one of the biggest impediments with dealing with that is we gotta address the bulkheads. The bulkheads are like sidewalks. <laughs> you know, when you talk about looking at the river as a corridor, and that's a huge lift. Hence, Irish Town Bend being sort of the example. And that's just one section of our, our river. And you have to understand, um, and I, I appreciate, excuse me. <laughs> I'll just hold it. I appreciate the, um, the, the comparison of the three cities, but these are very different places. All right, even though we all occupy that same stretch you know, of waterfront. So it's important to understand uniquely what each of these communities gives you because in its entirety, that is how we market and promote our region. And our region as a waterfront community is really, you have amusement parks in Sandusky. You have a huge opportunity in the city of Cleveland to connect the major cities downtown. You have a more small bedroom sort of community with Euclid. So we have all of the, ingredients here. It's just packaging that and really looking at it as an entire system versus these individual uh, communities. Mayor, how important is it that we do all work together as one shoreline? I think it's critical. Um, I think we, a lot of people have been looking at what we've been able to accomplish and now how do we extend that for the region? Because again, we want everybody to have access, not just the communities that live along the shoreline, um, and we can learn from each other. Next question, please. Well, uh, Rick, I want to follow up exactly on what you asked. Uh, there's always a lot of well-deserved attention on Edgewater Park, on now Whiskey Island and the New Bridge, on the river, certainly on downtown, and now Gordon. But wh where do we stand with extending the great things that are being done in Euclid through Collinwood and through the that section of Cleveland shoreline between Bratnall and Euclid. That's a, a critical section. You've got people who are anxious to see mm -hmm. what's happening in Euclid extend uh, yeah. all the way through that community. Some of those lake, lake shore mm -hmm. owners really want to see that happen. You've got uh, uh, people that, that see what's happening in Euclid yeah. and say, why not here? So where, where do we stand on that? Yeah, so uh, Western Reserve Land Conservancy, we actually just met with them uh, recently and uh, really looking at how we leverage the opportunities that Wildwood State, State, uh, State Park uh, has to offer, and also where Villa Angela St. Joe's, the former school, sits, and the land opportunities there. Because um, one of the key things with respect to the neighborhood, if you look as far of the eastern edge of Cleveland, which is North Collinwood, is that that is one community where you can be right there on the lake and not know you're next to it, literally not know it. So the desire has been to really open that up. 
And remember if you uh, recall what I said about taking what the community gives you. So that green space connection is actually there. If you look at Wildwood, if you look at all of the vegetation and things that exist around uh, VA uh, St. Joe's, and then talking about connecting it to uh, Richmond Heights, you actually have a trail proposal uh, that we're working on that's really gonna connect you down from Richmond Heights to that uh, uh, Wildwood area there. So it's all there for us. The Western Reserve Land Conservancy is working on some things that I'm not at liberty to disclose that oh, uh, they're uh, <laughs> conceiving. Um, but these are things that everyone is paying attention to. And, 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 and Dick, it's not necessarily that uh, we don't see these things. It's just about getting them up and running and taking the, the, the opportunities and looking at the resources and figuring out how you prioritize. And that's what's always has been the challenge, I think, for most cities is, you know, doesn't matter whether the economy is good or bad, good or bad public resources are always limited. So you're always deciding what do we, what, what's the play? What's the right play that's going to be the catalyst to have a ripple effect? Now, there's an anomaly today, and that anomaly is $511 million. You know, and how do you begin to prioritize that? And one of the things that we've uh, outlined as a priority is riverfront bulkhead improvements, which is a critical piece of the puzzle, um, and also looking at how we begin to connect to the lakefront. So we have to, again, triage and take every bit of resource and strategically place it in a way where we believe it will have the most ripple effect. But that is definitely on the radar. Thanks. Next question. I commend all three cities for your progressive ideas uh, to improve the quality of life here on Lake Erie. If you build it, they will come. My question is this. We don't have water problems like our brothers and sisters out west. We have a high water level problem. How do you address in your planning fluctuations for high water that keep some boats in boathouses, that floods docks for cruise ships? Mary, you've been fighting the erosion battle. You want to start? Sure. So um, our project had to be designed for high water level. Um, so part of the engineering part of the project included um, going up to a wave tank in Canada. Uh, former Director Holiday went up and got to witness it and wave um, simulations from high, you know, hundred year storms to. So our project had to be built um, to withstand high water and storms. Um, that's in the engineering, that's in the permitting. Um, the property outside of where our project is has been, I mean, there's homes that have been devastated, boathouses into the water, um, you know, the water up to the cliffs, taking away cliffs. And so that, as you go forward, our project was a way to, it provided erosion control for this three quarter mile, but it built the trail on top. Mm -hmm. So we really, right. again, that was part of the precedent setting. How do you not just put, the, how do you not just put armor stone stones at the base of a hill for erosion control? That doesn't, I mean, it provides erosion control, but it, you can't get down to the water. You can't, so this provided, you know, the armor stone and the concrete at the base designed so that the trail and the public space can be built on top. So it really combined both. I don't know if that doesn't necessarily answer your question, I know, but our, the project, the engineers, ours was designed at least in that project area. Um, and it was, it was built and approved, started before the high water. So we really had some um, concerns as the project got going that the water level was now much higher than it was when we had planned. We were at historic high water levels in the, over the last two years. So it changed you know, the construction a little bit, but the plan was designed well uh, to sustain that. Eric, you've poured so much into Jackson Pier. What do you have in terms of the thinking that went into that because of high water situations. Yeah, so we've had just yesterday, uh, Commission President Brady and I sat down with a marina owner who was looking at, re, you know, it, the pandemic was a great time for marinas and public spaces. And, and we have over 4,000 boat slips on the shores of Sandusky. And, and so that was a boom in our economy last year. But this year, they're dealing with a lot of flooding. And, and, and you know, we had some flooding the previous two years, but it's been the combination of the rain, saturated ground levels, and the higher water levels for a sustained period. So if we're going to make a larger bet 
on Sandusky Bay and Lake Erie is the driver of our economy, whether we're talking about algal blooms, whether we're talking about climate change and the impacts that that can have on uh, water levels and flooding and those types of things, we have to be prepared. We have to think about the longer term investments that we make uh, in addition to utilizing that public space as an asset for our community as well as for economic development. And so, you know, our engineer was part of that and they're looking at different options. One of the things that we can do is to utilize the Sandusky Bay pathway that actually creates a dike between the land coming from the right of way and the property itself. So it pushes the water back away from the property right now. It's going straight from the street as it comes down into some of these marinas. So we're looking at as many creative solutions as we can, but we can't take that for granted. And I think one of the things that all of our shoreline communities are going to have to figure out is, what if this isn't a blip? You know, someone mentioned a hundred year storm, but the hundred year storm seemed to be coming often. You know, mm -hmm. we had a windstorm blow down in our historic state theater last year. We've lost uh, two or three buildings to windstorms in Sandusky uh, with sheer winds coming off the lake. Mm -hmm. um, this could be the new normal. And so we're gonna have to adjust with how we, we develop along the waterfront. And we're gonna have to adjust with how we deal with floodplains and, and all of those issues. And, and again, you know, Fred mentioned, or Dr. Collier mentioned the, the federal funding. I think state and federal funding is going to have to be a tremendous part of those solutions because particularly in legacy cities that are already dealing with antiquated infrastructure and not always even having separated storm and sewer lines, uh, that is a massive investment for us to undertake. And that is one of the things that we cannot do on our own without help from Columbus or Washington. That's right. Thank you. Excellent yeah. question. Next. We've got a text question. It says, once the waterfront becomes accessible, wealthier neighborhoods develop. Wealthier people don't want to share neighborhoods with poorer people. How do modern city planners deal with this issue being gentrification, which bars poor people from, this, from these waterfront accessible neighborhoods? Yeah, we've touched on that. We knew the gentrification question would come up. Um, Mayor Gale, is that an issue that you've already hopefully thought forward to? Yes, I don't, I don't we're, I think we're not keeping people out. We're trying to welcome people in. So we're opening it up to historically the poor community was not, did not have access. I think the now question now was about the people's perception, not yeah. the city's perception. Okay. I, I mean, the, our waterfront's been used by more and it is attracting absolutely a more diverse community. Um, I think the issues we've had with that is increased trash and, um, you know, some people not following rules and we've, and, you know, we're trying to um, make sure it, it, it's a positive place for everybody and it, it has proven to be. Um, we are seeing new homes being built. We are seeing housing values go up. So um, we want to make sure our community is able to stay and we're not forcing people out. Um, we have not seen that yet. Um, and are committed certainly to having a city that's welcoming to all. Director Crawler, you're seeing it close right now because oh, yeah. the near west side is developing mm -hmm. fast, but you've got mm -hmm. CMHA housing a block away. Yeah, so let me start off by saying with respect to the open space, and that was a great question, uh, by the way. With respect to open space, in my mind as a, a planning professional, uh, open spaces are the great equalizer. And this is why the emphasis need to be on open spaces and then building off of that. The challenge becomes when we talk about the building off of that, the what, the product, the price point. And these are things that we are often grappling with with respect to the city of Cleveland. And one of the key things that I think we have done as administration is ensure that you have a diversity of product. If you have a diversity of product, then you can create the diversity of price point and then the accessibility is there. I'm gonna give you two tangible examples of something that we're dealing with right now. And I'm gonna start with the River Valley. So uh, with Irishtown Bend, which is going to be a tremendous. You like going back there, don't you? Oh, man. I mean, the reason why I keep bringing up Irishtown Bend is because there's going to be nothing like it in the, in the entire region when that's completed. And the other reason why that's so important is because that Ohio City uh, community is a very diverse community. Yes. Um, you have the, one of the oldest housing projects uh, in the country in Lakeview. You have a senior high rise that CMHA own that literally overlooks that asset. Those can't go away. So we have to reinvest and double down on making sure that those things are connected to that asset. So CMHA is going through a process right now where we're gonna be uh, reimagining Lakeview Estates. And also there uh, is gonna be efforts into rethinking or renovating that tower. These are all critical elements because when the area starts to change, those people should not be pushed out. They should be able to remain. And I think that's really where the effort has to be 
um, put with respect to policy and its intersection with design. And they need walking access to the water. No as question possible. about it. You know, and then the transportation assets that exist there. How do people get to and from the asset? So bikes, scooters, being able to walk, being able to catch a bus. So it's all of those systems layering on in these spaces that's going to create the equity, right? And equity is not about conversation. That's about words. It's in the transaction. You can see equity or inequity in, in the policy. So part of uh, also what we're doing. Oh, also, what we're doing, yeah. Also, what we're doing too is really looking at how our infrastructure becomes an impediment. Uh, so that same Lakeview estate that I was talking about, Route Two severs that from Ohio City. That's an Ohio City neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And if you look at it from a River Valley standpoint, the CMHA estates sit in the same peninsula that Nautica sits in. You wouldn't even know it. But again, because the severing of the highway dividing up that peninsula. So part of what we're trying to do is like turn that on its head and begin to start to connect the dots. And I think this is where the infrastructure uh, reimagination has to happen. And we have to punch through the uh, Shoreway Route 2 over there, right by 28th Street and all of that, mm -hmm. and really start to connect those residents back into the community in which they belong, which is Ohio City. Eric, I know you wanted to weigh in, but let's yeah, squeeze in fine. one more question. We're short on time. Go ahead. Thank you. So you've, you've discussed that the shoreline is about 90% privatized. When you're talking with those private owners, whether they're residential, industrial, commercial, a lot of common themes come up, like fear of noise or trash or personal safety, property security concerns. Would you talk a little bit about the myth versus the reality of some of those common concerns of mm -hmm. private property owners? Wow. Yeah, I can, I can speak to that, and it, and it ties in in some ways in what I wanted to comment to the previous question. I think it's always myth versus reality, and, and in Sandusky right now, we're having this conversation, and there's a lot of antiquated thoughts about what providing public access to a waterfront will mean for a property, whether it's going to be conflict with automobiles for an industrial property, or whether it's going to be undesirables, and I say that in quotations, for those who may pass along the linear trail. But the reality is when you create public access to the waterfront, you see the exact opposite of that. You see increased foot traffic creating more safety for the community. You see more vibrancy. You see rising property values. And you know we're working with Environmental Design Group on the Sandusky Bay Pathway Project in Sandusky. You know, they did a lot of that connections to Tremont uh, for the towpath trail. And where you see that, that towpath trail passed by Tremont, you see investment. And, and direct, Director Collier's point into the equity part of this conversation is it is absolutely critical that from your housing strategy or development strategy that you're thinking about mixed income, you're thinking about integration. But the worst thing that could happen to these neighborhoods, and I see so many of my old friends from Ohio City here uh, where I was at previously, and we used to always say we're a riverfront neighborhood and a lakefront neighborhood without access. <laughs> and it is the lower income residents of a community who suffer the most mm -hmm. to live in a place with such great proximity to these wonderful natural assets, but no direct access to them. And so when we bring that access, we bring a premium to their lives by being in a waterfront community, which if their homeowners can happen economically, but it also happens with increased opportunities for employment, and it just improves their quality of life. And then the last point I'll make on this piece is this, you don't just do this because it's the right thing to do, you do it because it's the economically smart thing to do. And I read a study several years ago that said, when a, a waterfront property is privately owned, there is a premium for that property. And then immediately across the street, you lose almost entirely the value of that property being waterfront. When it is publicly accessible, like what, what Fred was talking about in Chicago, that premium for being in a waterfront, not, not a waterfront house, but in a waterfront neighborhood, or even more broadly, waterfront community, can spread for miles. It's anybody who can get there on foot, get there on bus, get there on a bike, and then you bring value to an entire community. And I think that in places like Cleveland, like Euclid, like Sandusky, that have hemorrhaged population because middle class people have chosen to leave those cities, that we're a long way off from the conversation as long as we do development sensitively, and that bringing public access can bring people back into those communities. And I think that is the equitable thing to do. And I think public access can only enhance their quality of life or the equity within our communities. We will call this the first hour of a great conversation. Thank you all.
Today at the City Club, we've been listening to a forum on equitable waterfront access featuring Freddie L. Collier, the Director of City Planning for Cleveland, Kirsten Holzheimer Gale, Mayor of Euclid, Eric Wopser, City Manager of the City of Sandusky. Today's forum is presented by the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy and the law firm Mansur Gavin. It's the third of four forums to be co-sponsored by the Lincoln Institute. The final forum in this series will be held September 24th, featuring Dr. Raphael Bostic, the President of the Atlanta Federal Reserve Bank. That discussion will focus on how federal policy and land policy can combine to spur equitable revitalization in legacy cities. Community partners for today's forum are Northwest Neighborhoods, the Trust for Public Land, and the Cleveland Water Alliance. We appreciate your support and partnership of today's forum. Lastly, we welcome guests at tables hosted by Councilman Anthony Brancatelli, the City of Sandusky, Cleveland Water Alliance, Environmental Design Group, Health Tech Development, Lincoln Institute of Land Policy, and Mansour Galvin LPA. We are happy to have each of you here. You can support the City Club mission by making a contribution online, becoming a member, or texting the word DONATE to 216-616-CLUB. That's 216-616-2582 and follow just a couple of easy steps to make your donation. Tickets are still available for next Friday. Climate conservation and community power. Panelists will discuss best practices of engaging and investing in environmental activism, focusing on efforts that center the voices of BIPOC communities that are often the most impacted by climate change. August 10th and 17th, the City Club of Cleveland, in partnership with IdeaStream Public Media, will be hosting the Cleveland mayoral debates. I will moderate the first Nick Cast the second. All seven candidates seeking office have been invited to participate. To find out more about those mayoral debates and additional upcoming City Club forums, visit us online at cityclub.org. That brings us to the end of a lot of announcements and today's forum. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, members and friends of the City Club. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.